Now I'm going to introduce Elena Lucci, who's on my left. She's our next speaker. And Elena is an independent consultant specializing in urban settings and urban violence. Um, from 2000 to 2004, she worked at the ICRC as a protection delegate and then as head of subdelegation in Colombia, Rwanda, and South Sudan. Elena later worked as a humanitarian affairs specialist with MSF. And today, she's going to be discussing the experience of responding to humanitarian crises in urban areas, the challenges faced, the opportunities that are there, and the lessons learned. Elena? Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to this interesting uh, discussion. Um, as Wendy said, I'm going today I'm going to discuss uh, a bit of the, the why and the how uh, humanitarian organizations should be involved in urban settings. Um, I'll first look at um, the key scenarios uh, in urban settings and then uh, reasons for presence for humanitarian organizations and later on I will look at what are the, ch the how, so uh, the, the challenges and the opportunities for humanitarian organizations to work in urban settings. Um, so cities, uh, as, as Samuel said, cities are the new scenarios for humanitarians uh, to work really. Um, they are places of power, they are media hubs, uh, transport hubs, and uh, there are a lot, of, a lot of people move to the cities because of the resources and opportunities, but cities also uh, in, um, entail, uh, can entail inequality, exclusion, marginalization, and, uh, and clearly there are some issues with, with cities. Um, what, what can be the, the, the typologies of urban problematics that we see uh, today that, now, uh, that humanitarians are, are, are seeing nowadays? Um, I try to break them down in four different categories. So uh, one is the traditional uh, IHL conflict, so urban warfare in places like uh, uh, Mogadishu, Kabul, Baghdad, or nowadays uh, Damascus. But there's also um, increasing non-conflict uh, violence, armed violence, uh, mainly, a, a lot of it is happening in Latin America, but it's also uh, in other places, of course. And then this is linked to uh, either uh, gangs or narco-trafficking. And, um, and this, uh, this sort of violence takes place in forms of uh, routinized daily violence, uh, with social cleansing, armed robberies, thefts, uh, uh, kidnappings, beatings, uh, and the fight between uh, uh, non-state armed actors uh, versus uh, law enforcement agents for the control of territories and resources within the city itself. Um, then there's also, of, of course, issues of uh, uh, neglect and marginalizations within uh, slum communities, um, or s uh, yeah, slum settings. Uh, you can call it lack of development or structural violence, depending on, on uh, uh, different scholars. But of course, it's, it's mainly linked to the lack of services and lack of uh, yeah, basic services and infrastructures in these settings. And of course, given the, the, the poorly built uh, environment and the lack of resources, cities can also increase individuals' vulnerabilities to um, emergencies such as epidemics or natural disasters, landslides, flooding, and so on. Um, so uh, there are reasons uh, for humanitarian organizations to be present, of course, um, and uh, again, Looking at violence, for example, uh, violence has an impact on the health and well-being of uh, uh, vulnerable urban communities. Urban populations <coughs> are extremely vulnerable to violence. Violence produces suffering. Uh, there are homicides, injuries, uh, physical and mental trauma, sexual violence. In certain cities in Latin America, the murder rates in certain neighborhoods are higher than uh, the death tolls in, in the DRC or, or Iraq uh, to, to compare with. Um, so there's also, uh, of course, the population that are living in the slums communities, uh, they have limited access to basic services and um, health services or social services, physical and legal protection. And uh, if you look, for example, at the health system, uh, there's, there's, no infrastructure, there's often no infrastructures, no doctors, uh, and too many patients to deal with. Uh, and again, there are critical gaps. Uh, uh, that needs to be addressed, addressed, for example, in the provision of services for IDPs and vulnerable in the slums. Uh, people live in precarious condition. Uh, they're exposed to uh, abuse and exploitation. There's a general lack of resources and infrastructures. Uh, there's no functioning health center. There's often no uh, clean drinking water, no sewage systems. 
And if you compound all this with the um, fragile livelihood and extreme inequality, you might have a, a good, uh, an exploding cocktails of, uh, of humanitarian needs. And, and I think the humanitarian imperative really should apply uh, to the cities uh, as well. Uh, if you take, for example, the uh, the health sector, in particular, that has been uh, mainly uh, a case, of course, for Médecins Sans Frontières, um, you might have different scenarios, uh, but all are the consequences, for example, of direct violence. You might have, as I said, uh, loss of life, injuries and wounds. Um, or you might have scenarios where you have uh, displaced uh, populations living in the city. Maybe they're displaced because of violence or they might be as well uh, economic migrants, or, but um, they are, as I said, exposed to uh, the, these very precarious living conditions and they also often lack uh, nutritious food and hygiene and they're suffering from uh, violence and abuse they might suffer. And then you also have uh, indirect consequences of uh, effects of violence or uh, consequences of neglect and exclusion and discrimination that might result in epidemics, malnutrition, um, respiratory tract infections, sexually transmitted diseases, and alcohol and drug abuse. And all these, of course, and there's also chronic diseases like, uh, for example, diabetes and hypertension that are uh, becoming a key issue in urban settings that are, and they're not often not addressed because people have no access to healthcare and these conditions can become acute and become emergencies. And all this is happening in a context where it's uh, either a non-existing or collapsed uh, health system and uh, the health system might be collapsed because or might have never been there in the first place. And then there might not be enough doctors to cope with the influx of patients. And uh, in certain areas of certain violent cities, uh, health professionals do not want to work because they, they fear for themselves and for their life as well. Um, so th there's often also an overload of patients with no response on the other side. Um, but so we have seen the why uh, humanitarian organizations should work in urban settings. And then if we look at the how, uh, once a humanitarian organization has decided to engage in such settings, there are a lot of challenges. I will only list some because uh, there's, there's many more. And you will, f you will hear that they're very similar to the ones that Samuel, uh, Samuel listed before. Um, for example, uh, especially in violence context, understanding the, the, the power dynamics and the context is extremely, is extremely difficult. For example, uh, violence is difficult to predict as the multiplicity of actors, uh, criminal uh, and non-criminal actors. Uh, um, the environment is very volatile and the key feature of uh, urban settings is the speed and the rapidly, rapidly changing dynamics at which everything happens. And there's uh, often a civilian combatant blurring, and uh, it's very difficult for a humanitarian organization to understand who is in power, where, and when. Things change very, very quickly. This has an impact, of course, in the security management and in negotiating the access to certain areas of cities. Um, uh, there's, n there's a need for a humanitarian organization to have a context analysis, a security analysis really uh, per context and per neighborhood, depending on who is in charge and, and what's happening in a specific place. And, um, and often there's no notion of humanitarian space in these places because you're, you're engaging with the uh, criminal elements or non-state actors uh, where finding uh, humanitarian actors as something, something completely new and they're not used to the, the IHL uh, frameworks or terminology. Uh, and it is very important for, uh, for humanitarian organizations to really work on their acceptance uh, and uh, explain exactly what are the reasons why they are in certain, they're trying to enter in certain areas and so on. But once they're entered, uh, then there's a key issue which is uh, really linked to the needs assessment and uh, defining uh, vulnerable populations and identifying vulnerable population at risk population. We're talking about a loosely defined and dispersed uh, population and often uh, with IDPs or migrants or other um, population that do not want to be identified. And um, so how do you define your beneficiaries? Uh, there's different risks and vulnerability for every different community. And uh, it's very difficult to define who is systematically excluded from certain basic services and why and what can you do uh, for them and who are the most at risk. And this, this is totally outside the typical refugee ID key IDP camp logic where everyone is living in the same space and in you it's much easier to determine their, their needs. 
Um, and then if you have victims of violence, uh, it's very difficult to identify them. They do not come forward that easily some because most of them, they live in the same community with the perpetrator. So they are fear, they're fearing of denouncing them and, and then um, yeah, suffering the consequences from the perpetrator itself. So if you have uh, survivors of sexual violence, it's very difficult to, to make sure that they can, can come to, uh, to seek for help without uh, um, yeah, being identified. And then again, if you are in a, in a space where there's a, um, you're offering free services and you have a huge uh, number of population, you need to define also what are the limits of your, of your package of services and uh, what are your inclusion and exclusion criteria, uh, and what kind, what kind of categories of beneficiaries are you going to, to address, and particularly when we're talking about patients. Um, there's more challenges. Uh, it's really a, <laughs> a difficult situation. Um, there's one, one key issue is really how to address uh, long-term structural problems with the uh, coexisting critical uh, problems. So it's really the emergency versus development. And if you are offering health services, you will always be um, torn between offering uh, immediate care to a certain patient versus offering, trying to improve the health system itself. Um, <laughs> Or if you are uh, specialized in water and sanitation and you want to offer clean water, you might uh, find yourself working in a slum where the, which is illegal in most cases and you need to have a really a structural change uh, in places where which the authorities themselves do not recognize. So um, again, this, this dichotomy between uh, humanitarian development, it also has repercussions in, in urban settings. And again, how do you define your exit criteria uh, in this chronic setting. Which monitoring indicators are you going to use? We saw that, uh, for example, in the health sector, again, the mortality rate as an indicator is no longer appropriate. This is appropriate in, in refugee camps, in IDP settings, but in closed settings. But really, in, in urban slums, this is not the indicator you should be using. And, uh, and then there is no mm, baseline data to begin <coughs> with. The data is not disaggregated by, by slum or by neighborhood. So what do you compare your action with? Um, how do you measure your improvement, the improvement that you're bringing? And, and there's also an attribution issue because, as we said, there are so many actors working in the same space, often, hopefully, uh, that it's very difficult to attribute an improvement of a certain situation to your own organization only. Um, and then there's uh, humanitarian organizi organizations per se, they have uh, uh, a niche or challenge in identifying and managing the proper human resources. We're talking about different skills that are needed in these settings, um, working more with social workers, community health workers, child psychologists, and, um, and these projects need to be uh, yeah, they need to be a thought uh, for a longer term presence. And this again, it's a challenge for humanitarian organization that usually design a project for three to six months and then they, they'll see what happens. So uh, the approach needs to be reviewed. But uh, it's not only all gloom, there's also opportunities to work in urban settings. Um, as we said before, bef because of the, uh, of the many actors, there's a wide range of actors working in urban settings starting from uh, civil society organizations, NGO, the authority, local authorities themselves, the public sector, uh, the private sector, sorry. Um, so th there's greater opportunity of creating partnerships or creating referral system to specialized structures and services, which means that uh, a humanitarian organization doesn't need to do everything itself and it doesn't need to substitute everything as it's it generally occurs in, in rural settings where there's really uh, too few actors uh, present. But this coordination with the local authorities and other organization is an opportunity, of course, but it's also a must and it is a challenge for humanitarian organization who tend to work in isolation. Um, so uh, th th it is important to work in a network, not in isolation, but again, uh, there's need to be a sort of a culture shift for certain humanitarian organizations. Um, the importance of outreach and the use of social uh, workers cannot be stressed enough really to make sure that communities have access to health services and this is a great opportunity uh, to for working in these settings, making sure that people have access to health services, legal or physical protection and so on. <coughs> There's greater lobby and advocacy opportunities because it's a captive audience. People can go and see for themselves what's happening in, in other neighborhoods of the city. 
uh, these opportunities to use other partners are as multipliers of your own message or your advocacy efforts, uh, these opportunities to, um, uh, for community mobilization and so on. And again, it's a, gr a great learning opportunities for, uh, for humanitarian organizations on how to find the best way uh, to operate <coughs> and work uh, in these settings. Um, so what are my conclusions really? Very similar to the ones uh, that the, um, Samuel's. Uh, urban settings are the future location and justified context for many humanitarian interventions. Um, humanitarian organizations need to adapt uh, to this new reality and they, um, they can develop mm, relevant and necessary programs uh, in response to violence or in response to neglect, exclusion and marginalization. And it's only really a matter of strengthening and adapting uh, the work that they already have been doing for, um, for several years in other settings and, and move it to, to urban settings. So it's really a matter of adaptation rather than inventing something completely new. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena. That was, again, a very interesting presentation, and I think uh, resonated well with the, the learning in the city study. And I think, um, just to recap on a couple, I'm, I'm going to focus on the opportunities uh, that you mentioned at the end. Um, about this, it's interesting about this possibility of referring people to a wider range of actors and, and services, you know, creating partnerships, that there are more opportunities in urban environments to do that. And this, this very important point, which I know Francois will pick up on, that which is the need, the ab absolutely essential need to coordinate closely with, with local authorities. Um, and I, I wonder how much of a culture shift it really is, and I think it's something to think about, because there are very few organizations that are purely humanitarian ones. And I think most of us have experience of working in different ways with governments in different countries. So it would be interesting to hear some of your perspectives on that. Um, the point about social workers or outreach workers to make sure that people have access to the services that are existing or that we're going to augment or provide, I think is an interesting one too. And the, the uh, comment about having a captive audience in terms of lobbying and advocacy, and that would include both uh, the people that you're working with um, and, the, and the authorities. You know, there are opportunities to leverage uh, potentially longer term changes. Um, Okay, uh, having said that, I'm now going to move to our last speaker.